our five-year-old may be traumatized after accidentally witnessing my husband and I having sex. <laughs> Was it boring under the covers married sex or were y'all getting after it? I wish it was the boring under the covers. <laughs> <laughs> what is up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. We are so, so grateful that you joined us. Happy New Year to you. Hope you're still hanging on to all of your New Year's resolutions. You're changing some habits. Slowly but surely chipping away at new life. Hope you're doing well. If you want to be on this show Give me a buzz at 1-844-693-3291 or go to johndeloney.com slash ask, A-S-K. And Kelly is out of the building again. Good to see you, Jenna. Yes, good to see you. How's baby doing? Baby is growing. We're at uh, 30 weeks now, so starting the countdown. Very cool, man. That's amazing. That's yep. awesome. Very, very cool. Countdown begins. And you're naming the baby John, right? Uh, Not necessarily. Nope. But like mostly? Nope, not at all, actually. Hmm. Wow, that's not what I was expecting at all. I'm just going to sit here in silence for a minute. because Well, I was... considering the fact that also my stepbrother's name is John, that one might be a little weird. Or a way to honor both of us at the same time. I think it's fine. Wow, wonder you millennials, you and your disregard for legacy and tradition and honor and love and care. My goodness. All right, let's go out to Columbus, Ohio, and talk to Amanda. What's up, Amanda? Hey, John. What up? Uh, not much. So I've got a uh, pretty big question here. <laughs> I am okay, go for it. worried. I am worried that um, our five-year-old may be traumatized after accidentally witnessing my husband and I having sex. <laughs> uh, I'm worried that there <laughs> may be some negative downstream effects or I'm just hoping I'm overreacting. Okay, I got to paint me the whole picture here. Paint, tell me the story. Okay, so my husband and I are super careful about making sure that our door is closed and locked. But apparently, her ninja skills, she snuck into our bedroom and hid in our closet. It wasn't until I went to the closet to get dressed and flip the light on that I see her there with her face buried in her knees. So naturally, I go, oh my God, jump out of the doorway, throw on a robe and asked her, what are you doing in here? She apparently had had a nightmare and had snuck in there before we got the door closed. Oh, she had a nightmare. All right. Yeah. She had two nightmares, concurrent, we call it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, how how comfortable are you with me asking, like, real questions here? Go for it. Okay. Um, and this isn't me being, um, uh, like, just trying to be, like, I don't know, over the top. This is me like asking like for real questions. Okay. Absolutely. Um, was it boring under the covers married sex or were y'all getting after it? I wish it was the boring under the covers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Fantastic. Even better. Even better. Yeah. Um, so and where she was sitting, technically she could have seen basically everything. Lights on or off? Uh, there was TV light, so it was illuminated. Yeah. She hmm. says she didn't see anything. Well, of I, course. I asked her. Of course. <laughs> well, I mean, 1,000%. And let's be honest, like, what'd she hear, right? I'm sorry? What did she hear? There would have been some sounds, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're expecting our fourth, so, I mean... I don't even know what that has to do with this, but that's <laughs> fantastic. Oh, man. So, again, I'm not trying to be gratuitous. Um, I'm trying to paint, get yeah. a picture of what this five-year-old experienced, right? What she saw, what she yeah. heard. Um, all right. So, it wasn't, like, yelling or anything like that, but, I mean, it wasn't silent. Okay. Um, do y'all, I mean, was was there, did she hear things that would have scared her? That's the question. Do y'all talk dirty to each other? Was there role-playing or was there... You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it, I, I don't think there would have been anything like that. Okay, that was just baby one and two, not three and four. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, she leaves. You open the door, un <laughs> like, um, fully unclothed, and there's your child. How old is she? Five. Five. 
um, clearly in a like terrified position, right? Mm-hmm. And you jump back, grab a rope. Then what happens? Tell me, tell me how you walked through with her. What happened next? So I brought her over to me and picked her up and just very calmly, I was very careful about like my body language and tone, asked her why, what she was doing in the bedroom. And that's when she said she had had a nightmare. And then I asked her, did you, did you see anything? She's like, no. And then I um, proceeded to say, well, if you did, I'm, I'm really sorry if you did. That wasn't meant for your eyes. That's something that her adult husbands and wives Perfect. She hasn't said anything about it. It's been a week, but, okay. you know, I'm worried. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. You handled that about as perfectly as you could handle that. Okay. Um, I'd be willing to bet 99.999% chance she did see some or all of of everything. Um, and again, there is a difference between we're under the covers and explaining that. Like, she's seeing, like, what looks like under the covers wrestling, if you will. And in those kind of situations, often what scares a kid is she sees a different face on mom or she sees a different face on dad that she's never seen before. She doesn't have a, she doesn't have a psychology. She has angry. She has joyful. She has frustrated. She doesn't have ecstasy. She doesn't have um, that. uh, It's just a different face. Right. And so that often doesn't compute with a kid and it could scare them. Mm-hmm. Then there's explaining oral sex, and then there's explaining, oh no, I, uh, I like it when fill in the blank, right? Mm-hmm. That's a totally different conversation. And so, I think you did the exact right thing. Number one, kids are going to absorb your body language, and so if you're not freaking out, oh my god, up! But it's like, no, 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 we're totally partying and we're married. It's what we. So are supposed to do a, it's awesome. B and C, you weren't supposed to see that because that's for adults. That's grownups. Mm-hmm. And so you handled that perfectly. Kudos to you. High five to you. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, um, did you ever walk in on your parents? Not that I remember. No. <laughs> no, my mind, my, my, my mind blocked it out. All of it. All of it. All of it. <laughs> um, okay. So, what makes you think this is a? You've ruined your child, or you're going to scar your kid. I don't know. I feel like I worked so hard to try and like put up safeguards, like with using the internet and all that stuff, just to make sure that they don't accidentally see like inappropriate or pornographic images. And I feel like I've failed her in that (laughs) because she witnessed that. Okay. I think what the question you're asking is so important. And so I'm really grateful. Like, and so I'm laughing because I have a seven year old and a 13 year old. And to my knowledge, (laughs) <laughs> they haven't I'm, I'm just laughing because God almighty like the this can happen to all of us right um, but the question you're asking is really really an important one okay so mm-hmm. number one you and your husband rocking on to the break of dawn in your bedroom in your home is not pornography mm-hmm. and I think we have a habit of dumping all sex into something illicit is it too is is a five year old too young to see what she saw? Absolutely, no question about it. But there is a difference between her mom and dad and pornography. Okay, mm-hmm. and so a you didn't ruin your kid. You, your kid's gonna have some stories to tell. Make no mistake about that, <laughs> um, for sure, like one hundred percent. But you didn't ruin anybody. Okay. Okay. Um. Paint me a picture of the conversation Jill have had with with her and your other kids about sex before, or is this this the first time? Uh, no. So we are trying to make it like a not necessarily a common conversation, but one that's not so awkward. Okay. Um, like they know correct anatomical terms that those areas of their body are not bad areas of their body. It's just they're for them and not for other people. Okay. Um that people shouldn't see it. People shouldn't touch it. Um, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so you have done a great job of what I'd call priming the conversation. I also think that this is the awkward part where parents wait for the kid to say something. I've heard parents tell their kids, um, if you ever have any questions, just come ask me, which is, Mm -hmm. you might as well tell your kid, never, ever talk to me about this ever. As long as you live. Right. Cause no kid's (laughs) going to ask their parents after, 
getting caught with like looking at pornography on the computer or getting caught like hooking up with their boyfriend or girlfriend or no kid parent, no kid is going to be like, all right, dad, I'll come ask. <laughs> and actually mm -hmm. no kid's going to do that. <laughs> and so I think this is where you have to head directly into the awkward. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I like these along gender roles right now. Um, I think it can, um, it doesn't have to be, but I, 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 I think that's a safer way to do it right now, given your home context, but I would take your daughter out and make it something like kind of a special take, take her out and say, all right, we have to talk about the other night mm -hmm. and say, I'm not mad in any way. You're, you need to not sneak into mom and dad's room. And you know that, but I'm not mad at you at all, but it is important for me to know what you saw. Okay. And if she says nothing, I promise, I promise. Um, Say it's, it's, I would, I would push a little bit and see. And if she doesn't want to see, I think then if you haven't explained, here's how sex actually works. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, like daddy's part goes inside mommy's part. This is how this works. Um, then I would take that time to have that conversation there. So you're going to start to give her language that she may not have yet, or she may have it, but not know if it's okay to say it out loud. And also, here's the big thing. You're going to talk about sex and how it works and how great it is and the importance of what context it's good and what context it's not good. And mm -hmm. more important than the actual words you're saying is she's going to totally absorb your body energy. And if you are awkward and freaked out and scared to death and, oh, my gosh, I'm terrified to even be having this conversation, she will put a GPS pin in, sex is not okay to talk with mom about. All right. If, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And also, you probably don't want to <laughs> you don't want to explain uh oral sex to your 5-year-old either, right? You don't you don't do that either. So none of this is is like awesome or ideal. But this mm -hmm. is our role as parents, right? Absolutely. But the calmer you are, the more you smile, the more you laugh, the more you What did you see? Have you, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then being real clear about here's the context that's I think is important for us. One last thing I would add. Oh, so let me stop you there. So tell me, is that ringing true? Does that feel right? Um, are there, oh yeah, are I there, can totally do that. That's not going to be a problem. Okay. Um, do you believe her that she didn't see anything or do you think she did? I think that she saw something and maybe got scared and hit her face. Okay. All right. One question that kids often feel internally when they catch their parents having sex is it appears to them that somebody's getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to say mommy was not getting hurt at all. In fact, mommy is really enjoying herself in a private adult thing. Mm -hmm. And often that's the fear is somebody's getting hurt. Or I don't understand what's happening here. If she saw more, then she saw more. And y'all can kind of dig into that a little bit. Um, and I wouldn't press it. But what I would do is maybe put a pin in it and circle back to it in a couple of weeks. And then circle back to it in a couple of weeks. And um, the safer she feels to have a conversation about it, then it will hopefully it will, it'll eventually emerge there. You may also want to give her just a small bottle of bleach so she can rinse out her eyeballs. <laughs> I know. I feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Hey, here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. Um, I would, it, so I'm about to talk about Santa Claus. And so if you have kids listening to the show, you might want to shield their eyes. Or I mean, their ears from what I'm about to say. Uh, three, two, one. All right. So I recently had a conversation with my daughter about, um, I need to have a grown-up conversation with you, and it has to be a private conversation that I'm having with you. And we explained to her for several reasons that Santa Claus is not real and walked her through it. And I, every step along the way, I told her, we're having a grown-up conversation, and this is not for you to share with your friends. Mm -hmm. And I told her about a time when I was a kid, and I blew it. I told a bunch of my friends that Santa wasn't real, and I actually hurt people, and I didn't mean to. I was just trying to be the know-it-all idiot kid. And so mm -hmm. I told her that she can really hurt people and ruin some of the magic if she tells her friends. So this is just private between us. And she really took that to heart. 
And so I would reiterate with your daughter that this is private things. This is not to be shared with her friends at school. Okay. And remind her she's only allowed to have secrets with you, with dad, or with the doctor. That's it. That's mm-hmm. the only people she can have secrets with. And But this one is going to be a private thing between you and dad and um, her. Okay. Is that fair? Um, yeah, that sounds super straightforward. I can do that. And I don't mean this in a in a erotic way. So I would say like, I, I would like to, <laughs> I would love for you to call back and walk me through how you and your husband, the next time y'all are about to hook up, that you start in one corner of your of your bedroom suite and just go every square inch. I can't, I can't well, wait. I'm scanning the whole house now. <laughs> <laughs> I can only, only imagine that's how that's playing out. That will never happen again if I have anything to do with it. It 100% will. Hey, what about your husband? What did he have to say about it? Oh, he was slightly mortified, but he figured, he's like, oh, she'll be fine. Yeah. (laughs) On behalf of mental health practitioners around the country, we thank you for your future business, Amanda. Um, (laughs) Both of you. You may want to make a small account just on the side, just a high yield savings account. You can put a little money in because she's going to need to go to counseling and talk about this, but um, not really. I I don't think you, you, you've done such a great job norming, talking about body parts, norming what's okay and what's not okay, particularly norming grownups in a married loving relationship can do this right and it's okay and, and you weren't supposed to see this um this wasn't for kids to see so um you did great hey if you are watching this um or listening and you haven't had the body part conversation there's a great book by julie federico it's called some parts are not for sharing some parts are not for sharing by julie federico Um, It's a tiny, tiny little book, but it is a fabulous book to walk through. Um, Really, really excellent, excellent book. Um, (laughs) Best of luck to you, Amanda. And everybody, check your rooms. And on behalf of (laughs) your kids, lock the door. We'll be right back. Hey, I've got some great news for you. You get to choose. Whatever you do, good or bad, moving forward, the choice is yours. And when you're intentional about making good choices, over time they become healthy habits. Like choosing to slow down and make time for a daily practice of prayer and meditation. One thing that helps me every single day is Hallow. Hallow is the number one prayer app in the world, on planet Earth. And they're giving you three free months to get started. And people always say, you got to meditate, you got to pray, you got to have a spiritual life. And for many of us, we don't even know what that means. We don't even know where to start. That's where Hallow steps in. Three free months to prioritize your mental health, your spiritual health, and be intentional about finding peace through calming music, the lo-fi station that I love, guided prayers, meditations, and more. And Hallow isn't just Catholic. You can tailor the content towards your faith tradition. From scripture readings and prayers to journaling, Hallow makes it easy to practice mindfulness, build a deeper, more meaningful spiritual life, to figure out what you even believe in the first place, and choose peace. And remember, Hallow is giving you 90 days free. Imagine the peaceful habits you can establish in 90 days. Go to hallow.com slash Deloney today and follow the simple prompts to start your free 90-day trial. That's hallow.com slash Deloney. All right, we are back. And what, Jenna? Okay, so Andrew made a good point. Um, At the end of that call, you said, now, for any children listening, we're about to talk about Santa. Yeah, children should not have been listening anyways. (laughs) Just going to point that out. Just clarifying. (laughs) That's actually a fair point. All, (laughs) hey, listen, all I know is this, is in one of the questions for humans, Dex, the question for is when did you find out Santa was a lie? And one of my friends, his kid grabbed that deck and was crying. And that person works here with us and the kid, and they went running in like, what's wrong, baby? And was holding this card. And so he just texted me a picture of the card and was like, way to go, Deloney, way to go. So I now talk to your kids about sex, but 
for God's sakes, be trigger alert when it comes to talking about Santa Claus, Jesus Louise. And by the way, while I'm here, very few things do I get more hate on the internet about than this idea of don't lie to your kids. Telling your kids that Santa is real is not a lie. It's letting them participate in the magic of 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 a cultural myth. Don't take that from your kids. Like in the name of, I'm never going to lie to my kids. It's not, geez Louise, geez Louise. I ain't going to do fake snow. I ain't going to lie to my kids. I'm not going to let them play on AstroTurf football. That's a, I'm going to lie to my kids. That ain't real grass. Let them participate. It's fun. It's fun. The world has taken enough magic from our children. At least give them Santa Claus for a few years. It's a blast. All right, let's go out to Fort Collins, Colorado, and talk to Brian. What's up, Brian? Hey, Dr. Deloney. Glad to uh, be talking with you. Glad to talk to you, man. What's up? Uh, okay, 17-year-old daughter, uh, graduating in May. She has been dating her boyfriend for a year and a half. <laughs> He's also 17. He's also graduating in May. They want to get married. Oh, boy. Next August. They'll be 18. By then, they are both planning to go to college, different schools, same area. And uh, my wife and I have a lot of challenges, as you might imagine, <laughs> yeah. around this. <laughs> On and, your behalf, I do too. So, got it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, one, one of the many questions we have is uh, how much we ought to be paying for an actual wedding ceremony next summer. <sighs> I have I have an immediate response to that, and before I give it, I want to talk through like how have your conversations been up until now? Like how is this con how is this, this conversation addressed? Why do they want to get married so young? What are they so? What's the hurry? Like walk me through that. Yeah, right. Um, conversations have been plentiful. Okay, I think they've been most everything's on the table. Okay, um, honesty around this is a struggle. Uh, I am scared. Yeah. Just shared that with both of them the other night. I said, I'm not angry. I'm scared. And that's what you're seeing yeah. uh, for your future because our, our goal is for them to be successful. There you go. If they're going to get married. And w we think um, there's maybe a better time in life to get to start m with better odds, if I will. Sure. Uh, yeah. So the conversations have, have been good. It's been back and forth. It's starting to feel a little bit like it's a compromise or a negotiation with the timeline um, and money's coming up. As you might imagine, they, mm -hmm. they don't have any <laughs> and, and they're not going to have any being in right. school full time. Right. Um, man. Um, I, I don't need to run through the, the data with you. You know, statistically, this is going to be a tough one. Okay. Yes. Um, I think right now there's, there's kind of a two prong approach. Number one is the one you're taking, which I absolutely think is right. You're meeting with both of them, both of them. Right. And, um, saying, Hey, we're just worried about you. By the way, before I keep going, what does his parents have to say about this? Uh, school's a priority, uh, for sure. And seemingly less bothered by the timeline. Okay. Um, as long as the plan for education and, you know, succeeding there continue, uh, I think we have different outlooks on overall financial support, mm -hmm. uh, for them, um, and those have been separated into here, you know, what's school financial support and what is you're deciding to get married at 18 financial support look like, like a living. Right. Surviving. Have they made and a budget? So have, you, have you sat down with them to make a budget yet? Yep. 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 Working on it now. And also um, handing our daughter some expectations starting in January. Mm -hmm. So while she remains at home, while she adults and moves toward that, she feels what it's like to pay more of her share to start paying her car insurance okay. in monthly installments. Some of that kind of thing, that's been a point of contention, but it's what we've done with the other kids. We've just had to accelerate this a bit because she's wanting to get married at 18. Right. Our, our other two, two older ones didn't do that that early. We had a different timeline. So we're having to adjust those things as parents, which is 
I can tell you, it's been tricky. This is some of the hardest parenting we've done. Yeah. It's, I mean, it sounds like you're navigating it as well as you can. I think a gift to them. So let's take marriage off the table. Let's take something statistically improbable with a high likelihood you get hurt potentially forever and a small sliver of success. Let's say your 17 year old comes to you and says, I'm a world-class athlete and I'm going to the NFL directly from high school. I know there's some laws and rules about that, but let's just pretend they could do that. Uh, not laws, but there's some regulations and NFL guidelines and things. But let's say they could just do that. You would be failing your kid if you didn't say, okay, the weight room just got real, real serious. Like, like uh, we've been taking it easy on you because you're going to have to get real strong to head out onto that field. The workouts are going to get heavy. The responsibilities are going to, right? So, I think it's important to look at this as like, okay, if this is happening, we're going to prepare you in the best way possible. And part of that is letting this 17-year-old know if you're going to make adult decisions, it's going to come with adult um, responsibilities and those responsibilities have consequences to them. So I would be failing you as your dad if I didn't let you have some a taste of that, some practice of that before you make this big decision here. And by the way... Um, is she's already thinking about being 18. She's still 17. She's still living in your house. Right? Right. And so six more months. Yes. How, how many? Six more months before 18. Yep. Golly, can I tell you, I've, I, this is not the right answer, but I have a real thing in my gut right now that, well, I think this would be not probably wise parenting. You're, you're hearing me go through this in real time, okay? And I've got several competing things in my mind. I'm just going to speak them out loud. Is that okay? Please. Thank you. Thing number one is if you got six months, part of me would want to go scorched earth. You can't have contact with this person. I'm cutting off your phone. Like, you still live in my house. And if you want to leave after six months, knock your lights out. And I know the hipster cool thing to do would be like, well, you just got to accept it. So let's just ride this out and... I, part of me says, no, you're 17, you're my child, and I see the semi coming down the road at you, and I'm going to shove you out of the way with two hands, and you may even break your arm when you fall, but I'm going to protect you from that car. So part of me in my gut says, go scorched earth, and then the other part of me knows after working with young people for 20 years that you have a strong possibility you're going to lose your kid doing that, mm -hmm. right? Um and so I, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of this out loud in real time, and I want people to have uh, a picture of what it, what it looks like to think about something in real time. So I'm going to say this thing that my gut says to do, but probably is not the right thing. The second thing I think is, is right. You slowly turning on the, turning up the weight of adulthood. Here's what this looks like. I think the question you're going to have to ask yourself, you and your wife are going to have to ask, is the or what statement. Because if next August comes and you guys have put some hoops that they think that they'll go through. Because um, I've heard it said, when you get married, then you lose college. I'm not paying for college anymore. You're grown up. I'm not paying for your apartment. I'm not paying for any of this stuff. You're married now. I get that. And you also know as well as I do what happens when an 18-year-old just gets let out into the world. Their opportunity, their need to go make money can turn into some really bad choices very, very quickly. Um, and so part of me says, I'm going to put hoop A, I'm going to put hoop B. Like as long as you're in my house, you got to work full time. Cause you think marriage is going to be going on dates and stuff. It's a lot of work. Cause y'all gonna have to afford X, Y, and Z. So when you get done for school, you're gonna have a full-time job and you might be able to see him on the weekends, but that's kind of married life too. And so let's just get after it. And y'all come up with a dollar amount. You come up with a support amount. You come up with grades amount, things like that. But if I'm, if I'm speaking honestly and openly, I think if they want to get married at 18, I have to make a choice. Me and my wife have to make a choice is, is do we want to be a part of these photographs or not? And I will probably choose to stand by my kid's side and give them the best chance of success. But that doesn't mean I'm going to throw a $150,000 wedding. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we really agree with you. I'm so glad that we're chatting because several things you've said or have been either intuition or we've already started talking. And it is that it's a dance, right? To to support and love our kids. And if I want them to be successful, of locking them out and not joining them, 
is is the wrong recipe for me personally. I, I so, think yeah, I'll be I'll be by their side. It's the wrong it's the it's wrong across the board, and I can't tell you how, I can't count I cannot count the number of parents who their kid um, who came to me when I was working at the university and sat down. This kid's eighteen to twenty five year olds and said, "Mom, I'm pregnant." Mom, I'm gay. Mom, I'm dropping out of school. Mom, I can't be a lawyer because I flunked out. And how many moms and dads have come back and said, I would do anything to have my initial reaction back and have it be anything other than I love you and I'm here. And so I think your intuition is right. I think it's psychologically accurate. I think it's philosophically accurate. I think it's theologically for my, my particular base. I know what yours are, but mine, mine it's accurate. I also think just signing up for a, oh, this is so great, as though they were 26 and they've graduated college and they have a financial, they have financial security, that's not wise either because you're setting them up for a fairy tale that's going to come to a crashing halt, right? Yeah, I, th- I think that's right on, um, Doctor, is, is finding that balance of real-world expectations, a little bit of a, I'm going to say a sting, I don't even mean it to sting, but a reality check over the next several months of what this looks like. And then after that, it's it's tuition help, but then it's emotional support. Right. Um, I it do really th- is because I, I don't. I, by the way, I didn't budget the next three years for this. <laughs> so, well, so, so he, dad he, doesn't pivot either. Yeah, you know? and and I also um, I think now's a beautiful moment to say to your future potential. And now let's be honest. Um, when I was 17, I signed a 100% track, track scholarship at a university, out of state, 100%. I um, had the season of my life, and then I dropped the baton in first place, and I ended up losing the district track meet for our team by one point for the first loss in a decade. I then didn't ever want to step on a track again. I met a girl at a summer camp and moved states to pay to go to college. I ended up with a small scholarship and joined their track team a little bit later. But all that to say is who knows what happens in the life of an 18 year old the next, you know, year from now. Right. But, um, it can sure feel heavy right this second. Right. Um, so I want to, I want to hold that a little bit loosely, but also prepping for, Hey, this is what this is going to look like. We didn't plan for this. We didn't prep for this. And so you're not going to get $150,000. We're not going to blow the, the top off here. And by the way, this is my money. You don't have an entitled right to it. Son-in-law, my expectation for the man who marries my daughter is that we meet for breakfast once a week. That's happening. And I think you begin to treat him like the man he thinks he already is. If you're going to marry my daughter, you will meet with me once a week. But here's book number one. How to be a good, and you find a great book about being a man and provision and expectation and being a good partner. I think you you set the stage for him. And there is the daughter part and there's the raising the daughter part and she's my kid. But I think there's a looking across the table at him and letting him feel the expectation. My father-in-law did that in a, we lived in different cities, but he did it in a unique way that I felt a responsibility to take care of his daughter. And by the way, she's smarter than me. She was making more money than me at the time. So that's not what I mean by taking care of. But I meant you better be a person of fidelity. You better show up. Yeah, I love that idea. He asked um, for her hand last week. Okay. Um, and I brought something like you set up. So you just affirmed my my gut on that. And that's something that I think I think he's going to say yes to. I think he would get that. And and the thing you didn't say, which really is important to me, is it begins creating a space for me to love my new son. There you go. And I, I wasn't going to say it because I wanted you to have to back into it, but this is going to be for you too. Because at yeah. some point, your kids, you're, I mean, the hardest thing in the world, I say this all the time, but the hardest thing in the world is when you love another adult and that adult is in your life and they're making decisions that you project out are not going to be good for them. Whether it's our, our elderly parents, the way they spend their money or whether it's our, our siblings not saving money or doing something, doing, you know, messing with substance abuses or 18 year old kids deciding, Hey, we're going to go to a really adult thing without any understanding of what's coming next. Yeah. But you making peace with it over time. I don't know that you making peace with it, but I think it's maybe you raising him up and he doesn't sound like he has a dad that's doing that. 
I love the idea with you saying, I'm not prepared to give you my blessing, but I'm going to, and you sit down and you meet him and, and dude, I would challenge you to give him as direct eye contact as you could possibly muster. And I don't mean this in a pissing contest or like an old Texas male kind of thing. I mean, he needs to understand the weight of what he is taking on. He is asking to join with your daughter and for him to become the most important man in your life. And you're not just going to open your hand to that uh, willy nilly. Right. And so I think there's something about saying, I'm not prepared to give you my blessing, but you can earn it. And I think you're a good young man, but from this point forward, and I put a date on it, June 1st. If you meet me for a book study, you show up and help me with X, Y, and Z. You show me that you know what a budget is. Um, you show me that you can honor my daughter in X, Y, Z. When you present how y'all going to manage college costs and without taking a bunch of stupid student loans out, you can manage housing, you can manage some of these things, then absolutely. But just because you love her and you're 17, that's not enough for my blessing. Love that. Yeah, I really love that. And then helps us, uh, my wife and I, pivot. It's really been about our daughter, as you, as you might imagine, and well, trying course, to figure all that out. But I think it's a her and scenario. It really is about him now. It's it's game on. And yeah. it, and it, you know, the, foundationally, it's it's still about what do we need to do to give them the best chance for success against those odds that you mentioned, which are very searchable and findable, by the way. Oh well, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Divorce rates in America. So, oh yeah, yeah. So it, it really it really feels aligned with our value set. Um, and I think, I think people are going to listen to this, by the way, and I, I want to be real clear. I had some coaches in my life. I've had some mentors that have s- challenged me on an athletic field, have challenged me across a table, have challenged me nose to nose, and it was never me versus them. It was them with me calling me to something bigger than I even knew I was entering into. And so I think you saying, I'm not ready to give you my blessing yet because just because you like my daughter. By the way, 17-year-old, you don't even have a clue as to what love is. You bury a grandparent or a parent. You go through a pregnancy. You go through law. Now we're talking love. But at 17, you like my daughter a lot. I get that. So you're not ready for my blessing. Here's a roadmap to get it. Game on. And that is not you challenging him and, and sitting on the front porch with a shotgun. That's stupid. But that is you eye to eye, nose to nose, chest to chest, calling him in. Right. And that's a totally different ball game. And I think being very, very clear with your daughter, here is the dollar amount that we can afford. We have not prepped or planned for this and we don't have period. Here is what your next six months will look like being a 17 year old in our home with the intention of swan diving into adulthood. Here you go. If you don't meet this, I'll walk with you to the courthouse. I'll walk with you down the aisle. But my dollars and cents are not going to participate in this. Thank you for that. And so we're about to hand her in writing because she requested that. So that was smart. You know, the money part. Yep. And what that allows, the six or eight months allows, is a chance for that to be a learning, but also a a reconsideration of choices if she and he want to reconsider timelines. Yeah. And tell them we're done. We're done with that fight. You know, yeah. if, if that's it, that's it. But cool. here's, here's how we're going to show up and we love you. And, and so maybe, maybe there's some influence with that. But and I also don't, I also, I wouldn't be opposed to saying, and you wait till 21 and call it and y'all walk and y'all have your diplomas in hand. Here's the number I'm going to put on the table for your wedding. And by the way, it, if that sways them, a, if that sways them, that tells you how their, 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 their maturity level, right? Yeah, yeah, we've we've wondered about that a little bit, and you know, carrot stick mentality, mm-hmm. and it feels like really close to manipulation. Here's the Do beauty: we want to manipulate a good outcome. It's your money. Do whatever you outcome. want to with it. Yeah, you don't okay. owe anybody anything. Period. There's millions and millions and millions and millions of dads in your situation that would love to help their 25 year old. Their 35 year old daughters get married. They have no money. And so the fact that you have some doesn't mean she's entitled to it. I don't think it's manipulation at all. I think it's very, very wise to say, I will be able to 
I will, dad, because I live by a budget, your mom and I will be able to put $7,500 towards a ceremony in August, period. If you borrow a penny more on a credit card, you will lose access to all $7,500, period. I'm not going to participate in you starting an already very challenging relational endeavor in the hole financially. I'm not. I can't support that. I'll be there. I'll stand by you. But I can't watch you start off in the hole like that. You can do whatever you want. And then say, if you wait till you're 21 and both of y'all have your degrees, I'll make it 50000 And maybe she calls your bluff, dude, and you got to save some money over the next four or five years, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a mind reader too, aren't you? But, uh, but listen, yeah. statistically speaking, they won't make it through college dating. And if they do, good for them. Good for them. Yeah. But I don't I want you to, of, I don't want you to ever succeed. Um, I don't want you to ever lose, lose sight of this is our money and mm-hmm. never let her know. Like always let her know. I will be at any courthouse you go to get me. I'll be wherever you are. My participation in that though is going to vary based on what I believe is your ability to pull this thing off. Got it. And those are two separate things. Is that fair? That's fair. Will you call me and let me know how it goes? Yeah, we will certainly try. I love, I I love, in fact, I've never thought of this and I think I'm going to, I'm going to try to implement it. He may tell me to go pound Sam, but I love the idea of, um, somebody comes to marry, uh, you know, let's say some guy wants to marry my daughter and ask for my blessing. I love the idea of saying, uh, you and I are going to read this book together first and we're going to meet over breakfast or whatever. And if you live in another state, then I'm going to fly out there. I'm going to meet with you. This is that important to me. I want you to feel how important my daughter is. And if I can't afford a plane ticket at that time, I'm going to drive across the country and you and I are going to sit in a cafe for a while. And I'm going to ask you questions about love and fidelity and your pornography use. And I'm going to ask you questions about uh, budgets and perspective um, uh, education and prospective work careers, I'm going to ask you the questions that probably nobody asked you. And there's not going to be perfect answers to them, but I want you to know what I expect of myself and what I'm going to expect of the person who marries my child. My child can marry whoever she wants to. I can't anything about that. But if you want my blessing, that's on me. That's on me. Blessings to you, good man. I'll be thinking about you guys. Whoo! Hey, quick lesson. Stand by your kids, especially when it's hard. Stand by your kids. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, it's Deloney. Last year, I came to an inflection point. I was exercising regularly. I was disciplined in my diet. I was getting regular blood work done, and I was working hard on my marriage. I was doing all the right things but I had not dealt with old traumas and old stories that were negatively impacting my marriage, my relationship with my kids, my work, and me. I'm the expert. I teach others what to do, but I was slowly, piece by piece, falling apart. So I swallowed my pride, and with the encouragement of my family and friends, I reached out to a therapist and started seeking true, deep healing. A year later, I'm a radically different man, all for the better. And I know finding a therapist in your local community can be almost impossible. Or if you do find one, it's so expensive you can't afford to go even if you wanted to. And that's why I love the work BetterHelp is doing in the world. BetterHelp is online therapy with real licensed therapists who are available on your schedule. When you contact BetterHelp, you will fill out a short questionnaire and they will match you with the licensed therapist. Plus, you can switch therapists at any time for no extra charge. You've been working so, so hard, and now it's time to get to the root of your pain for permanent, extraordinary life change. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Deloney today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Deloney. Hey, what's up? We are back. Uh, We have a very special segment here. I asked my friend George Camel, who's got a new book coming out about finance. And the chaos and the nonsense that we're seeing all over the place. But it's the end of time and the dollar's going away and you should have a side hustle. Oh, you probably should have a side hustle, but you should have a passive income, just all the stupid stuff. So I asked my friend George, I was like, hey man, come on to the show with me. And A, I want to introduce you to 
our gang, but B, I want a behind the curtains look at you, the author of this thing. What in the world is happening with our money? And by the way, George is somebody that uh, I call on the weekends and I'll say, hey man, I'm about to move this money over here. What do you think about this fund? And he'll say, yeah, absolutely do that or don't do that. So he's somebody that I trust with me and my family's money. So I'm excited to have him on. We're going to just do a segment with him. And uh, I think you're going to get a ton of value. And he's hilarious. And he loves telling everybody that we're best friends. And we are not. Just kidding. We kind of are. Not really. Not even close. But we did go to the Blink-182 show and had to push his Tesla down the highway when it ran out of battery. Please welcome George Campbell. What's up, man? Hey, <laughs> thanks for having me on. It's good. This is a first time for me. I'm kind of nervous. I've never been on the John Deloney show. We've done a lot together, but not yeah. in your territory. Why, why does it make you nervous? I just feel like I'm not in control. Uh, that's probably a... Whenever we do I things like... I see someone for that. We try. <laughs> I've been telling you for a while you should. Um, man, yeah, I guess you've never, you've never been on ever? No, you've never invited me. I didn't want to remind you here, but now better time, uh, no better yeah. time than the present. But it's an honor. I'm a big fan, and it's nice to be like inside of. You're the not show. a fan. You never listened to my show one time. I listen. You've never listened one time. It's fine. Like we work together. Do. You hear me run my mouth all the but time. But I usually I need to watch comedy to make. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. looking for uppers. Yeah. And sometimes be, can, the show's heavy. It can be a little. And little, we take enough of that on the Ramsey show together. So I get my dose. Downery. I get my dose. Of my downery. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I do, I do it's love it. It's a gift, it. George. It's, it's a gift. You just had a baby. Yes. First kid. Tell me about it. How's it been? It's been hard. I will say that. Harder than I thought it would be. Whitney had a really hard pregnancy, and the delivery was great, and the baby's healthy. That was all great. But then she got mastitis, mm -hmm. and that turns into scarlet fever, which I didn't know existed in today's world. <laughs> and that turned into an abscess and, like, a minor surgery. And then the baby got the tongue tie thing. And so there was always just another, like, hard thing yeah. in an already hard season where you're, like, not sleeping. You're in kind of teammate mode instead mm -hmm. of marriage mode. Yep. It's just survival like, mode. Yeah, it's like, did you get the thing? You, you get the get hatchet, I'll get the rope. You get the dogs, I'll get the baby. Who's dropping the, you know what yeah, I mean? It's just yeah. a lot of logistics yeah. and not a lot of connection. Uh, and in between, there's some really sweet moments, you know, with the baby and all that. But it has been dramatically more difficult than I thought. And so mm -hmm. I have a newfound respect for parents. I used to like dog parents and be like, you know me, I'd be like, I'm a dog dad. I know how hard it is. <laughs> and I, I ate crow. I wasn't going to say that you and I have had that conversation. You're like, John, I've got I've got two French bulldogs. Yeah, God fed me some humble pie. You're in the middle of, um, you're releasing your first book, which is chaos, right? And you're hosting your own show and two other shows, right? So, I mean, life's bananas, right? Um, you and I are heading off on a speaking event coming up. So, like, so it's it's it would be chaotic for any person on the planet. Then you throw a newborn in there, and then you throw a very difficult first few months with the health with your wife, all the chaos that goes with that. Um, there's something about, I don't feel like anything. I don't feel at all. I'm just going to keep doing the next right thing. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to make sure I fill in the blank. I'm going to make sure I exercise, which I know you don't do. I'm going to make sure I do this, which whatever. But I'm going to keep doing those things. And I'm going to march along, even though I don't feel like it. And Well, now it's the time where it's easiest to veg out and stare at the screens and play a stupid game on your phone instead of doing the hard thing. Like you the, talk about the, the daily worst, choices. It's the worst. Like, yeah. Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah. Like if I had slept good, maybe I would work out today, John, but I didn't sleep good. So therefore, you know what I mean? Just right, right, yeah. doing it out of discipline. And sheer habit is worst. just so hard. But it's on the other side, your your daughter will wake up at one years old or nine months and she'll look at you and then you'll have, yeah, you, that's probably a good way to think of it. You're going to be, she's going to be one. Regardless. Regardless. And the choice you get to make is how will I have shown up for her when she turns one? When, those, when that light bulb comes on and it comes on before one, but when that light bulb comes on. Will I be all in or will I be a ghost of who I was, shell of who I used yeah. to be, right? Well, and truthfully, that's been the biggest struggle in our marriage right now is Whitney being like, hey, look her in the eyes. Like, be present with her. Don't veg out on your phone while feeding. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's been difficult for me. Yeah. After a long day of work and you just want, you know, you want to veg out, but you're like, I have to, I need to connect with this baby. Like, that's what's important to me. Yeah. I know I should do it, but my brain is, is occupado. Yeah. Or I don't know how. Right, it's yeah, a, it's a tool set. And it's hard. I, I'm used to having conversation. Let's have some wit and banter with a baby. You know, I'm making sounds. I'm singing. I'm doing all <laughs> the things I know how to do yeah. to see what she reacts to, which is fun. So you've got a 
you sat down in a room over the last year and wrote a book. About what? Well, it was a tough task to write a money book at Ramsey <laughs> Solutions. There's this elephant in the room, um, you know, big shoes to fill when you have the total money makeover, the best-selling personal finance book of all time. Right. And you're like, I'm going to write something different and better. Some, you know what I mean? Like, it's not even big shoes to fill because the feet are still in those shoes. Exactly. It's still sold in the same book. And store. so my goal was not to, like, rewrite the total money makeover. The goal was to write a book that feels like I am speaking to everyone in current times. Uh, of like, this is what the current state of personal finance is. Here's the real problems America's facing. Mm -hmm. Here's why people are saying they can't get ahead. And here's what I know to be true. And so it was a lot of, you know, I start with my story of how I started broke mm -hmm. with my, I didn't come from money. My parents were immigrants. Mm -hmm. I was $40,000 in debt. And over a decade of just hard work and following a proven plan, m my wife and I are now net worth millionaires. Mm -hmm. And it's not to brag, it's to say, if an average George can do it, you can too, but here's what it takes. The mm -hmm. gap between financial peace, between financial stress and financial peace is littered with myths and distractions mm -hmm. and traps and noise. So my goal was to cut through all of that and tell people the truth about the financial system designed to keep them broke. So the mm -hmm. truth about credit scores and credit cards and student loans and auto loans and mortgage traps and investing traps mm -hmm. and marketing and consumerism so that they can break free from this matrix that they find themselves in. Mm -hmm. And some, for a lot of people, become self-aware for the first time that mm -hmm. they're even in this matrix. That's it's like, a, that's, this is a simulation, bro. You got yeah. you can opt out. And they go, what do you mean? I don't have to, I, need, I don't need a credit score. Yeah. That's jarring to a lot of people. And so I walk it very carefully because I know what I'm saying is sounds insane to right. someone who's been in it their yeah. whole life, like I was. But to deprogram that, to break free from that and achieve all of your financial goals and become the person you want to be and to give the way you want to give, that's what the book's all about. It's not really about the money. We have to talk about money so we can stop talking about money. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, how, how do you – I feel like there's two different competing anxieties here. The anxiety that you and I talk about all the time, which is when your body knows that you owe somebody money, they're your master. They own you, right? And like if you don't do X, Y, or Z, they take your house. They take your car. They take your food. And your body knows I'm not safe in that situation, regardless of how good the deal is. There's also this competing anxiety, which is this inner desire to connect other people, to be a part of a tribe. And the entire culture says, if you don't have a new car, we, you and I were in a conversation the other day with somebody like, well, what, what do you want me to get a car with 100,000 miles on it? And we're like, we both have that. Yeah, what are you talking about? And it was like, you're not, that guy wasn't stupid. A guy wasn't entitled. That guy believed a story that he'd been told, which yes. is if you have a car that has more than 100,000 miles, you are being unsafe to you track. and your family, right? If you don't have a house with every kid with their own room and their own bathroom, you're failing your children. So I, I, I have to compete here, right? One of these is, all right, I know my body needs safety. The other is, I don't want to be the only one, right? I don't want to be the only person not doing these things. What do you tell somebody that says, I, I, I can't operate outside of this world? Well, number one, are they open to new information? Because if they're not, it's it's a pointless conversation. There you go. Yeah. So you have to go like, hey, my way isn't working. I'm curious to know how this way works because that sounds more peaceful. The goal of this book when it comes to helping people avoid some of those traps, and I point out the three stooges of wealth building is what I call it. But I think it applies in life. And I'm sure they? this applies to mental health. Pride, fear, and greed. Those are the three traps mm. I find when people are trying to build wealth but also when it comes to personal finance, they go, yeah, but I'm smarter than that. I'm going to be the guy who pays off the credit card every month and doesn't pay interest. Mm -hmm. Great. The credit, the credit card company loves that you believe that that's you winning, is that you're not paying interest and that somehow your life is going to be great and you're going to build wealth. Uh, fear is a big one. Uh, fear. There's a scarcity mindset mm -hmm. that we see with a lot of people. I never had money, so I need to keep stacking. Even when you're doing well, there's like this never-ending chase for the goalpost has kept moving. Well, we have a million, but really we need two million now because we factor in inflation. So we need four million. When you fa and so it never ends there. It never stops. Yeah. yeah. And then you have greed, which is I want to make a million dollars in the next five years. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, and crypto is the answer because I can't wait for a mutual fund to grow in a retirement account. Right. And so there's this element of I can do it faster and I'm smarter. Mm -hmm. And pride, fear, and greed I found is what causes people to fall right on their face. And it's one of the reasons we have to have the nice car because our – can't swallow your pride and drive a beater. 
next to your coworker who's leasing the luxury vehicle, it's embarrassing. That's the lease is making the car company very wealthy. And they want you to think it's a, I I just bought a car with cash and the finance office called me and they're like we're really concerned. Why aren't you financing this? She was like, "Well, you should lease it. That's that's what I do. It's the smart way to do it." And I'm like, I don't know how to tell you this. Like, I had to be like, listen, I host a show where I tell people not to lease cars, <laughs> that it's the stupidest way. And so I – in all the kindness, but it just made me remember how how much work we have to do to untrain people's brains mm-hmm. to go like there is a different way and there's a better way. There's just so much pain out there, and we take the brunt of the calls where, like, mm-hmm. life didn't happen the way it looked on paper. Yeah. Like, well, if I do this deal on Airbnb, I'm going to make so much money. And they call and they go like, we can't afford the payment. And the tenant screwed up our house, and the car is getting repoed, and we're on the other end trying to help them pick up the pieces. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons we're just like, debt equals risk. Less debt equals less risk. Don't owe anyone money. Your life's probably going to be less stressful. The, the hardest challenge, I think, is that I wrestle with in the conversations we have about money is when I talk to somebody, most of the people we talk to have never been on the other side. So I, I've been to your house, and... Um, you have a very, very nice home in an extraordinary neighborhood. And you could go to the bank today and probably qualify for four or five X the home you're in right now. Does that weigh on you at all? No. And I think it reminds me of uh, Dave was on our friend Graham Stephan show. Uh-huh. And they asked him, like, if you could borrow a million dollars and guarantee that you would get a hundred this much return, would you? D-? And Dave was like, no. And they're like, why? We just told you you're guaranteed to make this money. And he was like, I don't borrow money. Mm. And it was such a like, mic drop, you know, bad A moment of Dave just being like, I actually live by a set of values and principles mm-hmm. to where I'm not starry-eyed by what, by what could be and what the bank could give me and what investments could make. He's at peace with where he's at mm. and, and so confident in his plan to build wealth that nothing could sway him. And to me, that is like inv- invincibility. And so that's what I it's feel. being anchored into a value. Yeah, on a much smaller scale because my wealth is minuscule compared <laughs> right, to Dave right, Ramsey's. Right. But there's such an amazing feeling going like, my next home, I'm sure we'll move one day mm-hmm. into a bigger, nicer home maybe. We're going to pay cash for it. Yeah. And that means it's not going to be a home that is 4X what we – because it's going to take a while to do that with right. at the speed of cash. Yeah. But what I will have is peace and the muscle to save to where I'm like – we need to save for anything. It's not going to be a problem. Like saving for a twenty thousand dollar vacation or to like save for pay someone's adoption fees. It's just going to be another little goal. We go, yeah, we know how to do that. But someone who's never done that, they can't fathom even saving up ten thousand dollars to pay for a car. What mm-hmm. they can fathom is paying four hundred dollars a month for the car payment. So, so it's you, a, it's a shift mentally you got to make. You host multiple shows. You're a public figure. You travel the country speaking at events all over the place. Um, and this morning I had to run to Walmart to get something and talk to the person who's stocking shelves in the morning. They're like, that's cute, bro. Like, right, cool. Like, right, paid off your car, paid off your house. Real cool. Um, I work at Walmart because I have to. And my dad left. This happened. This happened. This is the job I could get. I make $18 an hour. Um, and I'm really grateful to have it. This kind of book works for y'all. Um, I appreciate it, man. But I'm trying to make groceries and I got to get a car. Like, talk to that guy. Mm. Well, I have deep empathy for those that feel like there's a certain kind of person that can get ahead with money Mm -hmm. and it's not me. Because I remember feeling that way. I thought you were born into wealth or you just never have it. Yeah. And wealth is a very generic term. To me, wealth just is is freedom. Yeah. Do you have options? Do you have margin in your life? That's a good point because wealth to me means more than I've got right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's because so I'm, I'm always chasing a feeling. Wealth to the person at Walmart is if I can make $20 an hour, it would blow my mind. Yeah. And the goalpost always moves. When you make 20, it's like wealth is now 25 an hour. It's, it's always more than I got. Exactly. Instead of saying, no, I'm, I'm at peace. Yeah, that's a good. So point, the, huh? the hard thing for those people out there who feel like this isn't for me, this plan, mm-hmm. that's nice, but I'm too broke for this or I'm too wealthy for this. Mm-hmm. There's this, like, everyone says this is not for me. The day you realize you're not special in the best way. Yeah. Yes, you're uniquely made by the by the creator, but I'm not special as far as uh, this plan not working for to me. math. To math, and so here's the the best thing I could say to that person is that it's not all your fault. 
but it's your responsibility. Okay. And that's a tough pill to swallow. Not by your hand, but in your lap. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so in parentheses, not all your fault. We have to own the choices that we've made that right. have got us here. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if those choices are, I saw my mom and dad handle money the wrong way, and I fell for that. Mm-hmm. I thought my parents were going to pay for college, and it turned out to be student loans in my mm-hmm. name. We hear those stories all the time. But the decision you have to make is, I have agency and autonomy over my life. Most people feel like life is just happening to me, and I got to do whatever the lenders say, and I got to do whatever my boss says. But when you realize I have control, not just when it comes to like what I do with that paycheck, mm-hmm. but – what career path I choose and how much effort I'm going to put in and what opportunities I say yes or no to and the decisions I make or don't make when it comes to those dollars and who I decide to hang out with. When you start to control those inputs, Mm -hmm. you get this little thing called hope where you're just like, oh, if I can dial down the noise of the social media gurus Mm -hmm. or if I can believe that, man, if I just go learn on YouTube, learn the skill, I can go apply for that job Mm -hmm. and make double what I'm making now. Yeah. But people have just had the belief beat out of them. They're just hopeless. They're Mm. cynical. And they think like, this is the world we live in, the economy, and it's the boomers. And I talk about that in uh, in the first chapter of the book. I lay out every single objection and excuse that we could point fingers at, and it feels good. It felt good to write it. It was cathartic. I was like, yeah, man, the housing market's insane, and college tuition's out of control, and the Fed, and Congress, and the guy in the White House. And at the end of the day, it was just when I point back at me, it was like, oh, gosh, not me, not me, not me. Back to the other stuff. (laughs) Right, right. It's not fun to pull up that financial mirror to go like, okay, even if you're not the entire problem, you are the entire solution. Yeah. And we know that. Like forgiveness from the government is probably not going to happen. Like inflation is not a, a dial I can control. But what I can control is I'm going to do that side hustle to get out of debt for the next two years. Yeah. And then I'm going to bust my butt and save up and I'm going to get married and we're going to combine finances. And now we have two incomes and now we're going to make a little more progress and a little more progress. And it might take you a decade hmm. and you wanted it to take a year. And we know most people, they overestimate what they can accomplish in a year, underestimate what they can accomplish in a decade. And that was yep. my story. Yep. Didn't happen overnight. It took 10 years. For some people, it'll take 20. Yep. That's okay. Run your own race because when you run other people's race, there's no finish line. Hmm. That's the problem with this kind of comparison mindset of like, well, John's, uh, you see the kind of car he has and the kind of house he has? Dude, like he doesn't pay your bills. All right. You don't know what he's going through. Yeah. And so it gave me great peace. And for that person who feels stuck to just go, all right. I'm not going to compare myself. I'm going to tunnel vision and go, what is the right next step for me? And I, I think that's uh, the reason that's so important is um, strangely, and I, it's weird to admit this, I, when I spent all those years working in higher education with, this, with students, it was the conversation was so much in my lap. What can I solve for them? Um, bring me your challenges and I'll solve them for you. And there is a part of that, right? Part of my job was to teach them what options were and not make that happen. But it was it was an eye-opening moment for me a few years ago when I was sitting somewhere saying, Hey, every time I've sat down with a family who's about to lose a child, every time I've sat down with someone who just lost a loved one, every time I've sat down with somebody who was marginalized because of any number of reasons society's kicked them to the margins. So we don't want you here. We, I always sit in those moments and they're heavy and they're dark and they are filled with tears and it could be two hours, it could be two months, it could be two years of conversations. We always land on the same question. What are you going to do now? And it was when I sat here with this money thing because I was always, for 20 years, I've been wondering what Washington is going to do about this stuff. And I knew, I know Dave Ramsey principles and all, but I kept saying, what's the right monetary policy and what's this and this? You were coming at it intellectually. Right. Instead of looking in the mirror going, okay, dude, this is the way this is right now. What are we going to do? The house is on fire. And it's like sitting here and watching it burn and being like, when is a fire department getting here? At some point, you got to go, hey, they're not coming. They're not coming. Or they're going to yeah. get here. It's going to be too late. Get the family out of here. Let's get all our, our stuff out of here. And so I think it's important for people to know in this book, you, A, walk through, we call them traps and stuff. And you and I laugh about it because we live in this world. But I think it's like I have family members that genuinely had never heard that a credit score is a scam. They didn't know that. That generally did, thought they were missing something when they didn't understand crypto. Like I'm behind or that they don't have a rental property that they have are 100% leveraged on. So they feel behind and they're just screwed. Yeah, they feel completely hosed. And so – 
A, you walk through all these excuses, all, all the things that we're told that aren't true. And then you walk through what I think is more important is a plan. Here's what you do, man. And I wish it was more complicated than that. Here's a plan. And it's not hard. It's hard, but it's not hard. Right? It's yeah. simple, but not not hard. Right? Yeah, and, and chapter nine is where we move from the system to breaking free from the system. So it's chained to the system. Here's all the things that you're chained to. And then I'm going to show you how to break free. And so I talk about it. budgeting is freedom, spending is self-control, mm-hmm. margin is breathing room, savings is peace, debt is a thief, mm-hmm. wealth is patience. And my favorite is generosity is joy, yeah. is what the whole thing kind of points to. And in the book, like the fruits of the spirit is the verse I use on the, on the flap, on the title page, mm-hmm. because truthfully, I feel like that's what we're all striving for. We want peace and joy and self-control. That's what we're aiming at. And money is just an yeah. obstacle instead of a tool to help us get there. And so right. if we can remove that obstacle and transform it into a tool to where we go, we don't have to worry about money. We got time now. We can connect with yeah. our, we can build those relationships that were broken. And you also loosen the chains of your employer running your life, other companies running your life, even in some ways, not legally, but the government running your life. Like, we're going to raise interest. Okay. I don't borrow money, so when you don't, okay. Yeah, when Dave Ramsey has a 0% interest rate because he doesn't have a mortgage, right. he's not as concerned. Or when they say, what's your credit score? He's like, I, don't, I haven't looked at 30 years. I don't know, and I just don't care, right? Finally, we have to solve this important thing, and then we got to go. There's a Reddit thread about this. There's a great conspiracy across the country we need to clear up. Let's do it. Are we actually friends? Oh, gosh. I ask myself every day, honestly. I think it changes. I think we, it's one of those we love each other, we don't like each other. Mm. I don't love you. I think I like you, but I don't wouldn't go so You like love. me, I love you. It causes some tension. It causes a lot but of yeah, tension. Yeah, on the show, and here's the backstory uh, John is mean to me. I'm gonna put that in air quotes because <laughs> I've actually been bullied and, uh, in, in my previous life when I was a kid. What John does I, is a defense mechanism that I see through instantly. Oh, uh, okay. You see me as a threat. That is correct. My masculinity is correct. a threat to your masculinity. It is overall, well, you have a perfectly groomed beard, and I just can't grow facial hair. So there it is. Instantly, I'm, I'm waiting it. for you to just come out with this. You have so, uh, you have biohacked your eyes with these devices called glasses. I don't have those. I just you have perfect vision. It's I just fine. I have blurry vision. It's fine. It's Wait, fine. the truth is, uh, I think I'm your friend. I'm your friend. I think you're my friend. You, we text each other outside of work. You send me articles that you find interesting. I pushed your Tesla down the highway when it ran out of batteries. That's a true friend. That's what friends do. So on the show, we're not good at showing it, truthfully. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like it. We're not good at showing each other affection live on air. But I, I like it that And way. it's kind of a bit, too. Like when it I'm is. like, I'm here with my best friend in the whole world, John Deloney, and you're like, we're not friends. Exactly. That, to me, is a bit. And uh, But they don't get to see us at the Blink-182 show singing our hearts Rocking out. Rocking out together. Let's see. So I think that I think that squelches it. Oh, we're gonna edit that part out. We're not gonna let this part go live. Okay, cool. Hey, breaking Thank you. free from broke. George Campbell's new book. Thanks for writing this. Thanks this awesome. for the support, man. You are awesome. uh, you get mentioned at least three times, and I apologize. I do call you a mediocre guitar player in the book. <laughs> I think mediocre is. Um, but it's compared to it's, slash. It's very generous. It's compared I'm to slash. I'm not even mediocre. But so. I do have some great quotes from you that are very helpful, and there's so much that aligns when it comes yeah. to what you're doing and what I'm doing in the money space. We both want people to solve for freedom, right. and I know this book is going to help you do that with finances. So thanks for helping me spread the word. You're awesome, bro. Thanks you're for a coming. great friend. And <laughs> I agree to disagree. Hey, what's up? Deloney here. Listen, you and me and everybody else on the planet has felt anxious or burned out or chronically stressed at some point. In my new book, Building a Non-Anxious Life, you'll learn the six daily choices that you can make to get rid of your anxious feelings and be able to better respond to whatever life throws at you so you can build a more peaceful, non-anxious life. Get your copy today at johndeloney.com. All right, we are back, and that was my friend George Campbell in that last segment talking about his brand new book, Breaking Free from Broke. If you're struggling with money, and it's hard to, let me just say it this way, it's hard to have a good marriage and you're broke if you're fighting about money. It's hard to um, be a parent that can plug in with your kids. It's hard to um, be good out on the dating market. I hate to use that language, but it is what it is. Um It's tough to do just about anything when your body's telling you you're not safe because of money. Go pick up George's book, Breaking Free from Broke. It's out tomorrow everywhere. We'll link to it in the show notes. You can go anywhere and buy it. Um, But it's good. Go pick it up. Go pick it up. And as we wrap up today's show, 
George mentioned a friend of ours, Jillian Edwards, the song that he plays for his sweet, sweet baby um, every single night, and that he sings. He doesn't sing very well, but he sings. He's at least he's a dad that sings to his kid. The song's called Meadow by the great Jillian Edwards, and it goes like this. Your love is a meadow. I'm free to run around in. Barefoot on the soil, I'm feeling like a child again. What if there's nothing to be afraid of? I think you're closer than my blood. What if you're in the lines on my hand? I think your heart is beating in my chest. I need to, I need only to breathe in your love. I thought you wrote this, Kelly, when you put this on my Christmas card, and I'm kind of heartbroken that Jillian Edwards wrote it. Hmm. Real cool. Love you guys. Stay in school. No new drugs. Bye.